Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. I got another big episode for all of you today. And now before we get started with today's episode, I just wanted to let you all know that after the last story, I do have an update for all of you. I'll go ahead and include a timestamp with all the other timestamps. And basically, I'm just kind of going over some things that you might have noticed with uploads this month. Uh, if I do get any questions or concerns regarding this in the comment section, I'm just going to go ahead and refer people to that part of the video in case they skip it. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started with these scary stories. Hello Creepy Fox and Creepy Fox listeners. I absolutely love this channel since the Creepy Fox uses listeners and subscribers stories so that the content is almost always something you haven't heard somewhere else. I'm using my pen name for this one, and this actually did happen. Because of the fact that this was many years ago, and people have hopefully changed for the better, I will be changing the names of people involved, and not saying the town names or the names of the buildings slash college involved. It's been about 20 years since this happened. I was just beginning my college education when I met an old friend of a friend from high school we started dating and I won't bore you with all the details of that. It was one of those passive relationships where you seem more like friends than an actual couple. Most of my high school friends still lived in the town we grew up in that was about 40 miles away one way. I would go home on the weekends and holidays to spend time with my friends, family and boyfriend, who in this story we will call Sam. So anyway, Sam and I had been seeing each other for two months when he began to spend more and more time out of town and I felt it would be better if we just broke up. When I called to explain that I needed to see him, I'm not so heartless as to break up over the phone. He replied immediately that he thought we should break up. There were a few tears shed and I'm sorry spoken, but it seemed like a good, clean breakup that would be simple enough. This happened just before Christmas and I was going to my cousin's home since my family had traveled to the other side of the country for the holiday. He lived a three hour drive from me so I was staying for four days to spend time with him and his boys so I was not at my home all that time. When I got back, my friends called me to come party at a local bar and plan our upcoming New Year party. They also brought my best friend Tom that had moved several states away so I was elated to say the least. As the bar is getting crowded and it gets hard to hear Tom speaking, we went outside to the parking lot. Now two things to keep in mind here. One, Sam drives a very distinct car that had a unique paint job on the doors. And number two, Sam did not know that Tom was my best friend. As Tom and I are talking, I see Sam's car go by, heading toward the neighboring town. No worries, he's probably visiting someone there. But a minute later, we see Sam's vehicle going the other way down the same road. Odd, I thought, but whatever, not really my business. Tom asks what the guy's issue is and I explain and add, he's probably forgotten something at home. So Tom and I continue to talk about old times. He slows down as he passes by the bar and burns rubber as soon as he sees us. Tom is getting angry and I'm getting confused. All I could think was, what the heck are you even doing? He does this back and forth at least two more times before my friend Ed comes out to check on us and to escape the crowd. I had asked him to keep an eye on the house while I was with my cousin. As we were chatting, you guessed it, here comes Sam's car, horn blaring and high beams on. I'm angry and confused. So I give him the one finger greeting for jerks as he speeds off. Ed now asks what his problem is and then proceeds to inform me that he has seen that car driving really slow by my parents house the whole time I was gone. All I could really think was, but he broke up with me. Why would he act like this? That night Ed decided to stay overnight on the couch at my parents house. He was worried Sam would try something stupid. Tom and my three other friends called throughout the night to make sure that everything was okay. About 5am is when Sam decides to call me. 
He calls me all kinds of horrible names and accuses me of sleeping with my friends. By this point I was seeing red, I was so mad that I remember growling each word into the phone. You broke up with me, why are you doing this? He then hung up. New Year's was celebrated near Tom's house. Since Sam didn't know where that was, he couldn't follow me. But we had fun together and other than burning a few old photos of Sam that I had, nothing really happened. Fast forward to going back to college. I got my dorm just fine before a really bad storm hit. No one was to travel the roads for the next week. As the week went on, my roommate and I started preparing ourselves for the start of spring semester and I kept getting calls. They didn't say anything, mind you, just heavy breathing. So I explained to her about Sam. She was worried and told me not to take it lightly. He's obviously unhinged if he's still following me. I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. I mean, we are small town folks, where everyone knows each other. This stuff doesn't happen here. Or so I thought. Once the ice was melted and school started up, I noticed that car going by and even parked near me. I was angry. I wanted to punch him right in his face. I made college friends that stayed on campus and they began walking me to and from classes. They tried to convince me to go to the dean about it. I brushed it off and told them that they shouldn't really worry about me. He's just acting weird because, well, he's weird. He's never hurt me or anyone else I know. Around February is when it happened. Two of my friends were walking me to one of my classes at the main building. One is a short girl with brown hair, and my other friend is African American. I mentioned this for a reason. As we get to the steps, Sam is just sitting there. He's hunched over so no one can see what's in his lap. He looks up and says, Leave it to a nasty slut like you to break up with me for him. He used a really bad racial slur here. I was beyond furious with what he said. I replied angrily, don't you think this has gone on long enough? You're being crazy. He then flashes us the object he's hiding. It's a gun. I'm gonna kill you when you least expect it, he says, as he conceals the gun and runs off. We rush to the dean's office and they call the police. They didn't catch him that day, but they were ready for him the next day. I was on eggshells the whole time until the police informed us that Sam had been arrested. I was granted a restraining order. They found he had two hunting knives, a mask, and a loaded firearm in his car. Sam's family decided it was best that he was to serve his sentence in another state. They were horrified at what he had become. Nothing is worth the pain and suffering this caused all of us. If you're hearing this or reading this and you think you might have a stalker, don't wait to get help. This was actually about five years ago, and ever since it happened, I can safely say that my cousin and I aren't exactly looking forward to camping again, at least not in the middle of nowhere. To start off my story, me and my cousin, who in this story we will refer to as Jennifer, were on a weekend vacation checking out the Grand Canyon. This was something we had planned on doing for quite some time, as both of us were taking a geography course in which we had to do a write-up on the Grand Canyon, though our time there was shared with laughter and excitement. We left early on Sunday morning, satisfied with all the pictures and information that we needed. Before returning to our home in LA, however, Jennifer wanted to go visit Rachel Nevada on her way back. She's pretty interested in all the strange things that happen at the nearby base. And I'll admit, she sort of got me curious as well. Therefore, that's where we were going. So after several hours of driving, we arrived at the little inn in Rachel. Of course, right away, my cousin looked like she was in a candy shop. She jumped up and down with excitement looking at the pictures and newspaper articles that were scattered around the place. After a late lunch, my cousin talked to the owners for a bit. Meanwhile, I stepped outside and took a nap in our camper. Now, I don't know how long my cousin was in there, but by the time I woke up, 
it was starting to get dark. I'd say around 6 p.m. This was when my cousin Jennifer walked in and said, Hey, cousin, you know it sounds like a great idea? I was talking to the shop owners about all these things. They told me that if we go out into the nearby desert, you can sometimes see strange lights, and oftentimes you can see mysterious aircraft. Come on, let's check it out. It should have been a great idea, but little did we know it was just the beginning of what was to come. See, for those who don't know, Rachel is a small town, and I'm not talking about the kind you might see about, let's say, a thousand people. There are literally less than a hundred people here, and on this day, we would have guessed we would have probably only saw about ten of them. I mention this because you don't really expect to bump into anyone, especially out in the middle of the desert. Of course, my cousin and I were told not to go down any unmarked roads, due to most of the area being private land, so we stayed to where we were only supposed to be. But we end up driving for about 15 minutes from Rachel, until Jennifer and I find this spot that's just off the main road. Out there, there was nothing but desert as far as the eye could see. For Jennifer and I, it was perfect. With no one out here to bother us, we now go ahead and get our camping supplies ready, setting up a small campfire and our chairs. And now we sat down looking up at the stars, as well as enjoying some of the food we had brought with us. So far, everything seemed pretty normal. Apart from seeing some occasional lights, which we explained away as normal planes, finally around 11pm, we go ahead and step inside our little camper. Fast forward a couple of hours later, I want to say it's around 2 in the morning, I just woken up to use the restroom. I was still in the state of being fast asleep and waking up. Out of nowhere, I could hear what sounded like tires on sand driving near us. I thought I was originally hearing things, but when I heard the sound of a car door close, I knew right away we weren't alone. Now, I was hearing the sounds of footsteps in the sand as they slowly started to approach our camper trailer. Understandably, I was confused. After all, we hadn't seen anyone else follow us out here, and as far as we knew, we were on public land. This was when I started thinking that maybe we were somehow on private land by accident. The more I kept thinking about it, the more the details didn't quite add up. As I'm pondering all this, I can hear the footsteps just continuously pacing back and forth by the door. No one called out. Regardless, I now go to wake up Jennifer, who obviously was a bit confused by the situation. What's wrong? Can't you see I'm trying to sleep? Jennifer told me in a dazed state. That's not the problem. Somebody's outside the camper, and they're walking around. Don't you hear the footsteps? Jennifer now started to tell me perhaps it was just an animal, but when I mentioned the sound of the car, which she hadn't heard herself originally, she was now thinking it might be the police. Now, against me telling her not to do so, Jennifer shouts out and says, Who's out there? If you're a police officer, could you please identify yourself and let us know who you are? There is no answer. No sort of acknowledgement whatsoever. Also, the footsteps we are hearing all of a sudden stopped. Now, this is the moment when we had the bright idea of just leaving and driving back to Rachel. But there was a problem. Where were the keys? Let's just leave. I'm sure if it was the police, they would have said something. Wait a minute. Where are the keys? So, without the keys, we're pretty much stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. We don't know whether or not the person might have had anything planned for us. It didn't help that from where our window was facing, we couldn't see anyone, nor any vehicle. Honestly, the thought of being murdered in cold blood started to run through our heads. Jennifer and I now started to freeze when we begin to hear the sound of the door handle jingling back and forth. Luckily, it's locked, but that told us whoever was out there had really bad intentions. Suddenly, we hear something hitting the door, and this was when me and Jennifer were running around the camper van trying to find those keys. As it turned out, Jennifer had left the keys in her backpack. So, with them now finally in hand, we start the engine, and we race out of there. 
Once we were at quite a distance, I looked out the window and I could see the headlights of a jeep turn on and they drove off into the desert, never to be seen again. Fast forward a bit more and we're back in Rachel. We ended up parking near the little inn and we ended up staying there until the sun came up. All the while, we were expecting whoever was out there in the van to follow us here, which meant sleeping was pretty much impossible for us because of the constant anxiety keeping us up. Once the sun finally did come up, Jennifer and I stepped outside. Now we could see the damage that was done to our trailer. There were a bunch of dents and scratches on the door, and even the trailer itself. Those weren't there before our strange encounter, that's for sure. Anyway, after some food, we drove back to Los Angeles and we had to explain to my dad, who had let us borrow the camper, how the vehicle had received the markings and the damage. In the end, we never did figure out who had done that and why they were trying to break in, though I don't think it takes a genius to figure out, like I mentioned before, they had really bad intentions. I'm a paramedic slash firefighter living in a small town. It's not so small that everyone is on duty, but it's large enough to have at least two of us on standby. By the way, here is some quick context regarding myself. I'm 27 years of age and male. I'm a little on the shorter end, but I am pretty muscular. I've had friends and co-workers refer to me as beefy. Anyway, this night shift, I had an older guy with me as my partner. It was roughly 10 at night and it had been pretty slow. I remember being bored, so we ended up putting on a movie called House of the Thousand Corpses. I won't spoil the story, but let's just say it's pretty scary at the end. Right after one of the scenes involving some officers being taken out, our station's alarm goes off for an unknown medical emergency in a pretty desolate area. Of course, after watching a movie where, quite frankly, people died, we were on the edge, but we had to do our duty. Are you kidding me? There's nothing in that area? For real? It's probably just some teenagers trespassing or something. We better go check it out. Somebody might be hurt. It doesn't take us too long to arrive to the address, but when we are there, we do find an abandoned farmhouse. We now made our way over to the door frame since the door was missing, and we wanted to make sure that it was actually safe. Therefore, we stayed quiet and listened into the sound of crickets and the light howling of the cool evening. No lie, moments later, we ended up hearing a light giggle, and then a voice from a woman saying, Hey, is everything already set up? Shh, be quiet, they're going to hear us. We then hear a male respond. Both my partner and I went pale and white as a ghost, and we book it. I don't think I've ever seen such a chubby guy run so fast, that being my partner. We made it back into the ambulance and sped down the road. Once we thought we were a safe distance away, we called dispatch requesting they bring in the police. When they did arrive and investigate, they found a pentagram carved into the floor with some candles and a knife as well. It's been years since that incident happened, and we don't know what would have happened had we stayed around. Just driving by that old dirt road all these years later still gives me the chills. Although this happened over 15 years ago, it has never been something I've been able to forget, mainly because of how quickly things escalated, and how, to be honest, I might have possibly bitten the dust, so to speak. At the time, I was 29 years of age, and I was living in Wyoming with my now ex-wife, who had been working at a nearby hospital. I myself was home, on my own, working on a project late at night for my plain old boring office job. At around 10pm my stomach started to growl and I decided at this point it was a great idea to take a break and grab something to eat from the kitchen. I found some ramen I could warm up in the microwave and so with a bag of some potato chips I stood next to said microwave and began looking at the tiles on the wall. Not even 30 or so seconds after the ramen began to cook. I hear a loud crash come from somewhere in the house. I got so scared that my first instinct was to grab one of the kitchen knives in the sink and then walk toward the hallway to try and investigate what I had just heard. 
maybe that wasn't the smartest idea. Well, sure enough, I just so happened to have caught the glimpse of two large figures wearing ski masks entering my room, which was at the end of the hallway. Chills now started to go down my whole body when for a split second, I see that one of the intruders has a gun and the other has a baseball bat. Now, I wasn't about to take on a home intruder with a knife when they have a gun, so it's at this point I'm telling myself I need to get out of this house immediately. That's what I started to do, but before I reached the back door in the kitchen, I heard the microwave beep, indicating my ramen was finished. Well, there was sure no way I was going to eat it now. I booked it out of the house, just as I heard the voice of one of the home intruders call out to me. I forget what exactly was said, but it was something like, come back here. Anyway, I jumped over my back fence toward the front yard, and at this moment I saw one of my neighbors across the street with his cell phone up to his cheek, waving me down and telling me to come over quick. I did, and he ushers me in right before I get the chance to explain what was going down inside my house. As it just so happened, he was on the phone with 911 saying that he looked out his window and saw two suspicious individuals peeking through my windows and trying to open them. When he saw one of the masked burglars smash my window with a baseball bat, that's when he told 911 officers needed to pick up their pace. Bear in mind, I saw one of them with a gun, and my neighbor hadn't seen this scary detail. Thus, we told the lady on the phone about the gun, and she advises us to seek shelter. Well, this made the entire situation that much more intense, as we're now instructed to shelter in the basement. There was a little window in my neighbor's basement that's at floor level with the front yard, and we watched from there as officers took position behind cover and called for backup. After 20 or so minutes, the home burglars walked out of the house unarmed with their hands up, and the nightmare that had started just a bit earlier had finally come to a peaceful ending. Oh well, as peaceful as could be, all things considering. Anyway, it was only until a few days later that I learned those two burglars were actually wanted for quite a while as they were tied in connection with a bunch of other home invasions. It's just so scary to think as I look back on this. What if I had fallen asleep? Or worse off, what if it was my ex-wife who was there by herself and didn't react in time? Very scary thoughts, for sure. Oh, luckily, it's a distant memory, and I can now just take the time to tell you all about it, instead of having it happen to me again. Which, thankfully, nothing like this has ever happened to me again. Hey, creepy fox. Here's my scary story that I've wanted you to read for a long time. It shook me up pretty badly. For some quick context, I'm a waitress at a Danny's in North Texas, not to be confused with the more famous Denny's. The Danny's I work at is located right next to the highway, one that leads to Oklahoma. This means that even in my small town, we got a lot of traffic, mostly from people who are on road trips or they're just traveling by. Now I guess I should mention this part. It's in my nature, but I am way too nice for my own good. This ends up biting me in the rear end way more times than I would like to admit. But whatever, I'm still a pretty good judge when it comes to figuring out people's nature. Anyway, I was working with what we like to call here the swing shift from 2 in the afternoon to 10 in the evening. It was during one of the slow hours I was out on the floor getting tables ready for the eventual evening rush. That was when I noticed one of my co-workers sitting down with a man and a woman. Very weird. Curious to what my co-worker was doing with them, I head over seeing if perhaps they needed some sort of assistance. Turned out she was trying to make a long distance call for the man on one of our work phones. However, it doesn't work. So I decided I'd go get mine and let them use it. No problem. We also need a cab. Do you mind helping us out with that? They followed. I went ahead and called my husband and asked him for his help with that since I needed to go back to work. Meanwhile, I wrote down the order from these two and then head toward the cash register to enter it into our system. Actually, sorry, but it turns out my roommate is already on his way here. We appreciate all your help. 
The man walked up to me shortly after I left and informed me. No more than a minute later, both of them walk out, getting my manager's husband to give them a ride for $50. Some time later, we were in our nightly rush, and as I waited at a table talking to this friendly family, about six police cruisers and two SWAT vans whipped by our Dannys. Note that this was a very rare sight for our small town. You will sometimes get a police chase, but to have it go to the extent of having the SWAT involved? Naturally, I was becoming curious. So on my break, I went on my phone trying to find out what had happened on the news. Sadly, there was nothing. That was until no longer than 20 minutes later. It's at this moment I felt my phone vibrate. I look at the number and I don't recognize it. Normally, I never answer a number I don't recognize, but something was telling me to check nonetheless. Hello? Who is this? I questioned, thinking I would be responded to by a telemarketer. Turned out that it was a detective. I need to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, sure. What is it? Who are you and who did you let use your phone? I told him and what he responds back with was truly shocking. It turned out the guy who made the call on my phone was wanted for armed robbery in East Texas. He was considered to be highly dangerous. I started to freak out and naturally I had a panic attack. Some time later he sends a cop over to the Danny's and he takes statements from both myself and my manager's husband. They left shortly after that. I'm not too sure what happened, but apparently I can make an armed robber feel so bad about the bad things he's done that he left me a $5 tip. So thanks, I guess. I don't know how to feel about that. Hey there creepy fox, I got a story to share with you regarding an encounter I had with this really crazy person back in 2014. And here's how it goes. For reference, I was 22 years old, and this is from the perspective of a female. At the time, I was living in a small town with my parents, south from most of you listeners, here in Mexico. I was working for a family-owned restaurant as a waitress, helping serve customers, and sometimes doubling up as a cashier when we got a little extra busy. One night, we were relatively slow. And it was during the last hour of the restaurant's operating hours. I was really looking forward to getting home, as I had quite a lot of studying I needed to get done for university, and if I didn't at least get something in, I wasn't going to do well on the next morning's pop quiz. Spoiler alert, not important to the story, but I ended up getting a passing grade on that quiz. Anyway, one thing I couldn't help but notice was that one of the customers, an older man in his early 50s, kept looking at me very strangely, and even at one point was catcalling me. I ignored his remarks as not to feed into his emotions, and eventually he seemed to get the idea. However, fast forward some time, and we're now having to tell him he's got to leave since we needed to close up shop. He wasn't going to do that, at least not before grabbing my arm, then pulling me toward him, putting me into an embrace. That was really weird. And if it wasn't for one of my fellow employees speaking up, and also me trying to push him back, he wasn't going to let go. But let's just say he was quite angry after that, telling me I shouldn't have given him so many hints if I wasn't interested, before he cursed all of us out and walked away. Not gonna lie, that in itself was very weird, considering I never once let him on. I mean, why would I? Clearly this guy was crazy. Now this story doesn't end just there. Oh no, it's only going to get that much worse. Well, at least for me that is. You're just the listener. I digress. We go forward to the following week. I haven't seen that creeper in the time span and I just arrived home from my shift and stepped into the shower. You see, my boyfriend was going to pick me up since he wanted to take me out for dinner to this really nice restaurant that's across town. We had only been there once before, and from the time we did go, I had an absolute blast as bands played music on the stage, and patrons danced and had fun. Back to me. After the shower, and once I was dry and changed, I started to look around for my phone charger as my phone's battery was running low, 
and I wanted to at least have a little bit of juice left. This is when it clicked in me that I left it in the back seat of my car. So I put on some chancolas, get to my car, grab the charger, and then turn to head back inside. Here is when something happened. I saw a large figure approaching me from the side in the darkness. My boyfriend is relatively tall, so I assumed that it was actually him. But I was wrong. Approaching me wasn't a familiar lovely face. Nope. Remember the guy I mentioned from the restaurant who just seemingly grabbed a hold of me and then got mad when I told him it wasn't okay? Here he is and he's got the creepiest smile across his face. I've been watching you for the last few days. I didn't know you lived near that restaurant. I remember him saying, as my blood starts to run cold and I begin to fight back a panic attack. Yeah, uh, sure. Could you please leave me alone? I responded back nervously, just praying to God he was maybe just trying to get into my head and would have left and moved on with his life. Not the case. He begins to approach me as I'm now backing up slowly not keeping my eyes off of him whatsoever. After what seemed like an eternity, really maybe just about 5 seconds, I turned to run back into my house and pretty much slammed the door on this creep's face. I should correct that, I did slam the door on this man's face because he started to yell at me and said he was going to make me pay for hitting him in his face, but it served him right. He now started to pound on my door like a madman as I go to my phone and click on my boyfriend's number. Oh, luckily he answers on the second ring, as I now start to tell him there's some creep at the front door that's trying to break in, as I start to explain further that my mom and dad were out at the time. He says he was just turning the corner and would gladly get this guy to leave, whatever it took. With one final, please be careful, I end the call, and watch as seconds later, my boyfriend reaches my home. He pretty much dove out of the front seat and ran up to the porch, yelling at the stranger that he had to leave or he was going to call the police. I couldn't believe what the man started to tell my boyfriend. He tells him that he was just trying to return my wallet to me that I left at the restaurant before my boyfriend calls him out on the obvious lie. Now this statement caused this creeper to lose his marble so to speak, as now he's cursing my boyfriend out and then begins to accuse me that I shouldn't be leading him on, nor other guys. How sad. I didn't know being nice to customers automatically meant, I'm interested in you, please ask me out on a date. Well, luckily my boyfriend's threats were enough to get this guy to back off from the front porch, and presumably to get out of my life, but not before he tried to attack my boyfriend. They got into a quick little scuffle, but after getting his behind hand into him, the creeper leaves with his tail tucked between his legs, just like a scared puppy, probably because he was way too embarrassed after the loss handed over to him. Now luckily, this did end up happening toward the end of my semester, so I did change my schedule to the mornings as to hopefully avoid ever seeing the dude again. He did show up to the restaurant a few more times when I was working there, but thankfully after my boss, who you really didn't want to mess with when he's angry, told them that if he ever showed up again and caused me issues, there would be trouble for him. Well, let's just say he never bothered me again after that, and after a few short months, I quit and moved in with my boyfriend on the other side of town. To that creeper who tracked me down, I really hope you've gotten some help, because it's not a good look for you when you're trying to go after people and then attempting to break into their homes. As a quick edit, I forgot to mention this. My parents have told me that he's never showed up to our home again, so that's good. I've got many stories to share regarding my years in high school in the mid-2000s that still act as a reminder of how life can throw curveballs at you. There's the good moments, like how I met my girlfriend and I got my first car, and there's also the bad moments. Like the time I got detention because I decided I'd be an edgy teenager and told my teacher I wasn't going to listen when he told the classroom that I was being disruptive. Then you've got the scary moments, the ones that left you going, wow, that really just happened and I made it out in one piece. 
that's what my submission to the creepy fox is all about. Here's what went down on a random weekday after school. I was hanging out with my best friends, Julian, Eric, Austin, and Brian. The plan was to go to Little Caesar's Pizza, a roughly 15 minute walk from campus, and grab a bite to eat, as well as talk about all the silly things as teenagers would talk about during that time period. We arrived, ordered ourselves a large pizza and some breadsticks, and spent the next hour sitting outside on a bench, talking, laughing, and enjoying being young and healthy. One by one my friends started to leave, getting picked up by their parents, until it's just myself and Brian. The plan was that I was going to spend the night over at his house, and we would be up late playing video games, since we had the day off from school the following day. Brian called his dad to ask him exactly where he currently was, since he was going to pick us up at roughly 4.30pm, but when he tells us that he was stuck in traffic and we would have to wait for maybe another hour, we grew impatient and said we would just walk to the house. It's about 30 minutes of walking, so it's nothing too crazy. With our backpack secured and our stomachs full of deliciousness, we now begin to walk toward Brian's house taking some back roads and neighborhoods to make the quick adventure faster. A few blocks away from Brian's house, we reached a major street and saw the 7-Eleven that we often frequented. I asked Brian if he wanted to pick up some chips for our gaming session, and Brian agreed and said it was a good idea. We walked into the 7-Eleven, and we now start to make our selection of what it was we were going to consume. This was when things would take a turn for the downright terrifying. Just as we were about to get in line, I happened to look toward the front entrance and saw someone with a bandana covering their face, wearing oversized dark clothing, enter the store with a purpose. He suddenly yelled to everyone not to move and that he's got a gun and wasn't afraid to use it had anybody disregarded his commands. Well, as not end up like cheese with a bunch of bullet holes in us, we do exactly as he says as we get on the floor and watched as he approached the front counter where the cashier has his hands up. Now, bear in mind, even though the masked man claimed he had a gun, we never did once actually see him take it out, which was starting to make us wonder, was this guy really telling the truth, and did he really have a gun? Either way, the cashier started to hand over money via a shopping bag, when from what seems like completely nowhere, a police officer just seemingly walks into the 7-Eleven. You should have seen how fast he reacted. He took out his service weapon and tells the robber to put his hands up. He does, further stating he's unarmed and he wasn't actually going to hurt anyone. The officer was obviously not going to take any chances since we did see him radio for backup. Long story short, police did manage to rescue all of us and they placed the man under arrest. As we thought, he was unarmed that afternoon, and from what we gathered, he was hoping his statements would have scared us enough to comply, to which his credit, it did. But that was pretty much all there was to it. Shaken up, we did eventually make it to Brian's house, and we did our best to put the crazy moment behind us. What a story we were able to tell the next time we went to school. We suddenly became these local mini-celebrities, with the whole campus asking us how we made it out in one piece. To which we said, trust us, it would have been better had we not been involved in such a scary experience. So yeah, that's the scary story of mine. This happened in January of 2013, when I was 27 years old. For some context, I'm male and I live in northern Pennsylvania and work as a cashier for a small grocery chain. I still work there today, even through the current global circumstances, and luckily I am getting full time. On the winter evening that I wanted to talk to you all about, which I'm sharing with you, I had a pretty rough shift. Normally I can handle rude customers who might be angry if we're out of a certain product or having a tough day themselves only for them to lash out on us, but for some reason these comments this guy made toward me were enough to throw me over the edge so to speak. Basically he cursed me out because I refused to give him more of a discount than what he was offered on the coupon he had shown me. 
I can't tell you how hard I had to hold in my rage, and just stood there with a fake smile, having enough of his outburst. And by the time I leave work, roughly 8.15pm, I was mentally exhausted and I couldn't wait to start what would be a three day weekend vacation. My plan was to catch up on some sleep and then spend time with my girlfriend and her family. Just a shame the start of this mini vacation would start off for all the wrong reasons. And no, getting yelled at by a customer isn't the scary part of this story. So to get home it's roughly a 15 minute drive. However on this evening since it had been snowing quite heavily, it was looking to be closer to 30. Not an issue since I was actually going to go to one of my local coffee shops anyway and pick up a warm cup of tea and muffin to go. So I did, and with my drink and snack in hand, I decided I wanted to take the longer way back, roughly 45 minutes of a trip, so I could enjoy my drive and the tea. Now anyone who lives in rural PA like me knows that when you leave your town city limits, it gets very desolate and quiet. This was a perfect description of my current location as I'm out in the countryside listening to some Johnny Cash and singing along to his greatest hits, like Ring of Fire and Walk the Line. Anyway, I'm beginning to turn the bend to head back into town when suddenly through the snowfall hitting my windshield, my headlights shine upon a figure that waves me down further up ahead at the side of the road. It was quite strange, and as I got closer, I noticed it to be a woman, my best guess since it was hard to tell due to her being all bundled up in her early 30s. Hey, are you okay? I said with a voice of concern as I slow my vehicle to a stop and she approaches my passenger side door. Here's what I roughly remember her saying to me. Yeah, I'm okay. I sort of swerved off the road and got stuck in the snow down here in the trees. Do you mind helping me grab my belongings and giving me a ride back into town? Now let me pause really quickly before I continue on with my story. Stopping for strangers at night, in the middle of nowhere, is probably the worst thing that you can ever do. It's sad to say, but more often times than not, you're in for falling into someone's trap. Also something else to bring up. She claimed she had swerved off the road and into the tree line that was beside me. However, I couldn't see any vehicle, nor was I able to see any signs of a vehicle swerving. You'd think you'd see tire tracks in the snow. Also, you'd think she might be hurt, but she looked perfectly fine to me. Again, I asked her if she could point me in the direction of the car, but this time around she gets a little bit nervous before ignoring my question entirely and asking if I could get out of the vehicle and assist her. Now considering it was in the low 30s, I really felt bad and didn't want to leave this woman out in the middle of a snowstorm. Therefore I offered if she wanted to wait in my vehicle, I'd of course take the keys with me, so she wouldn't drive off with my car, she could wait in there. However she was insistent I follow her and she didn't want to wait in the car by herself. Huge alarm bells. Just to play it safe, I grabbed my revolver from my glove compartment, then placed it inside my coat pocket. I then carefully stepped out of my vehicle, locked the door, and with a light from my cell phone, I joined this woman as she quickly races ahead of me. Hurry, it's cold out here. My car's this way, she said in a rush, disappearing behind a large set of trees. At this point, I'm actually getting a bit paranoid. Not seeing any vehicle, I call out to the woman, only for me to get a complete surprise. I heard footsteps and shuffling, and out from seemingly nowhere, these two heavyset men walk out and then demand I hand over my keys, wallet, and any other personal belongings I might have on me. The setup. I couldn't believe it, but the woman had tricked me, and all the alarm bells that were going on in my head were for an obvious reason. In what was probably not my smartest decision, but looking back, maybe it was, I took out my gun and then fired a warning shot into the air, which caught the men by surprise. They suddenly put their hands up and told me not to shoot. Whoa, relax. We're just playing with you, man. Put that thing away. One of the men says frantically, as both quickly hid to cover behind some trees, where, moments later, 
I hear the woman chime in and say not to fire another shot. I took this as a, these guys were amateurs kind of response, but as not jump ahead, I kept my eyes on them the whole entire time, keeping the revolver pointed in their direction, and I finally lost sight of the three once I'm back inside my car. I pressed on the gas, left, and quickly called the police telling them about the two men and the woman that I encountered who tried to mug me for my vehicle. Let's just say I had a tough time getting sleep that evening, as I kept fearing, even though I know it wouldn't have happened, the three would find my home and try to burglarize my house. Police never did catch those three, and since that nightmare of an evening, I refused to drive out of the city limits at night. The only reason I remember this happening on Valentine's Day of 2011 in my small town in North Carolina was because I ended up getting rejected by the girl I had a crush on ever since that semester had begun a few weeks prior. It was quite a blow, but my friends told me I was pretty brave for getting the courage to tell her my feelings, which yeah, I guess that was true, and I eventually moved on and got a girlfriend, who I'm still with right now. But that afternoon was quite a downer. All I wanted to do was get some donuts from one of my local donut shops, head home, turn on Netflix, and just watch a bunch of movies with my dog sitting by my side. And so that's how it was going to begin. Uh, once my final class was let out at 3pm, I hopped on my bicycle and rode 20 minutes to the donut shop, eagerly awaiting to get my hands on some heavenly sweet goodness that would look to alleviate my stress. With my mouth watering and salivating, I soon arrived to said donut shop and see that apart from one car that's in the drive-thru, it looks pretty empty inside. Awesome, I thought. It would be a quick in and out, and I can head home and enjoy my afternoon. Megan, the owner of the donut shop, welcomed me in with open arms as the front doorbell chimed and a refreshing blast of air conditioning hit my face, like that satisfying feeling of when you jump into a swimming pool on a hot summer's day. I saw inside the display of donuts, the typical flavors like glazed, chocolate, and jelly filled. Perhaps what really got to me, however, were the Valentine's inspired donuts which instantly soured my mood. Megan noticed this and asked why I looked so gloomy, and I quickly mentioned the girl I asked out and rejected me. Megan felt bad and ended up offering to give me a donut for free, and I actually went ahead and accepted the offer. Now, as I was talking with Megan and picking out my other donuts, a man in an oversized khaki-colored trench coat walked in through the back door. I only noticed him for a brief second as he passed by my peripheral vision and then got behind and just stood there. Hey, you got any smokes on you? I hear a grunting deep voice say behind me as this garbage-like smell enters my nostrils from what I would find out would be this guy's really bad B.O. No, sorry, I don't smoke, I reply with a half smile on my face as he starts to look in all directions and then begins mumbling to himself. Megan looked at me and thought it was very strange, but ended up continuing my order, finally getting my sweets into a pink box. I then went ahead and handed over my $10, and I was on my way. Or so I thought. While I'm preparing to take my seat on my bicycle, I happened to look into the donut shop through the outside window, and saw that the man who was behind me moments ago was reaching for the cash register, trying to take out money. I don't know what came over me in that moment, but I drop my donuts and I rush inside, not even realizing the fight I was about to get myself into. I tell the man to knock it off and that he now needs to leave, and he suddenly pushes me back, telling me to mind my own business or I was going to get hurt. Megan meanwhile is struggling with the man and trying to fend him off, as a baker in the back is calling for the police. I got up and start approaching him again. And as I'm just a few inches from socking him right in the nose, I saw him put his hand into his trench coat pocket. I did connect with his cheek, and he stumbles back for a few seconds, as what sounds like an object hits the floor. I took a look and saw a switchblade which was now lying about halfway between the front counter and the tiles where I currently stood. 
My heart immediately began racing, thinking that had I not knocked some sense into him quite literally, he would have held on to that switchblade, then possibly have stabbed me with it. With this sudden revelation, I kicked the switchblade further underneath the front counter as it ended up sliding over to Megan. She then grabbed it and suddenly this man books it out the way he came from, not even saying a single word or making some sort of struggle to fight back. Now thank god that cops weren't even that far, because when they searched the area, they were able to locate him quite easily in a nearby alleyway, though what would you expect when he's got a khaki colored trench coat that easily stands out. Anyway, I gave my statement and after a bit of talk with the police, I ended up heading back home, though that afternoon's mood had changed completely. By the way, in case you're wondering, it turned out the man who I'd stopped that afternoon was a local homeless man who was well known by the police department for being a troublemaker. Unfortunately, that donut shop closed a couple of years later. However, I still will occasionally talk to the owner as my mom and dad are really good friends with her and her husband. Being a small town girl living on a farm with my parents it was just as peaceful as you might begin to imagine. Although life there was pretty uneventful, there was this one time I had a strange feeling. It's like I couldn't help but notice somebody was sneaking around my home and trying to break in. Now I never did see anyone, which was what made my premonitions that much more bizarre. That was until this one evening I started to hear noises coming from one of the windows downstairs. I wanted to figure out what was causing this disturbance, so I head down and check. It's moments later I'm able to see a man in a black ski mask running away from my home, heading into the nearby fields. I got so angry. Why you might ask? It's because home should be a place you feel the most safe. You shouldn't have to worry about some home intruder trying to break in. Therefore, I ended up running after him. By the way, I was 7 years old at this time. Yes, a spunky little kid who wasn't going to have her night suddenly ruined. Sadly, I wasn't able to catch up to him, but I did catch something else. I wasn't sure why he had done so, but he had thrown his ski mask on the ground. I took this as evidence and run back home, presenting it to my parents. Why did you run off, sweetheart? They asked, curious of my sudden departure. Some man tried to break in. How did you two not hear that? I told them back, frustrated with their reaction because they didn't believe me. By the way, this was in the middle of the day. Showing them the ski mask proved nothing as they claimed it was just part of a costume given to me by a friend. As they start heading back to what they were doing, I remembered the window I saw him at and that's when I went to go check it out. I tried opening the window at this point and the whole thing suddenly shattered. It fell straight to the ground, breaking off into hundreds of tiny pieces. Finally, my parents believed me, as they ran over to see what had happened. My parents finally called the police, but sadly they never did find this home intruder. I am just happy that all these years later, I have never seen anyone sneaking around our property ever again. My story is kind of an interesting one and that it doesn't involve a stalker or some creepy guy. Don't get the wrong idea, I do enjoy these sorts of stories, but after you've heard so much of creepy guy give someone a creepy smile and then says something creepy but nothing else happens, you start to get burned out. Anyway, this was just a week before Christmas in 2010 and takes place in a small town called Indiana in Pennsylvania. To start off, I'd driven to the airport in Pittsburgh to pick up a friend of mine who would be spending the holiday with me and my family. This was the first time he had ever been here and I was really excited he chose to spend Christmas with me. We had all these plans set up, such as going ice skating, building snowmen, and just watching movies in the living room with endless bowls of popcorn. I picked him up in front of Terminal A and first thing I remember him telling me was, you weren't kidding when you said dress in layers. It's freezing out here. My friend Charles is from Las Vegas, and even though they sometimes get cold temperatures in the winter, nothing compares to a winter in PA. On the way back to Indiana, while singing along to Christmas songs, 
I mentioned to my friend that there is this gas station that sells this really amazing hot chocolate. I sort of teased him any time we talked over the phone because he's a huge fan of hot chocolate. At last he would be able to try it and I could stop giving him such a hard time. We got to this little gas station at about a quarter past 9pm and it's completely deserted as expected at this time of year and night. When we walked into the little convenience store, I showed my friend toward the back where the hot chocolate machine was located. There was little Christmas ornaments lining the machine with a plastic Christmas tree that sat peacefully beside the dispenser. The cup holders that held the small, medium and large cups were wrapped in Christmas lights that danced along to the Christmas carols that played over the intercom. While Charles decided which drink and toppings he wanted, I told him I was going to go use the restroom. No issue for him since he also wanted to get some little souvenirs while he was here. Now, this next part I didn't actually witness myself, but thanks to my friend he has been able to help me write out what happened up to the point I witnessed things with my very own eyes. My friend described that as he looked at some of the little souvenirs he saw from outside the window, he saw somebody pacing back and forth. He described them as paranoid, acting schizophrenic, shaking and appearing to be out of breath. My friend says that he tried waving at him to see if maybe he needed some sort of assistance or help, but the man continued to walk back and forth while fumbling for something in his sweater pocket. My friend continued to look at the little knickknacks before heading to the cashier so that he could pay. Now, Charles has always been the outgoing and friendly kind of person, so he hit it off with a cashier as if they were long lost best friends. This was the moment when our evening was about to take a turn for the terrifying. All of a sudden, Charles hears the bells from the front door chime. The man Charles had seen pacing back and forth from moments before had come into the store, grasping a pistol. Charles describes his adrenaline being shot into his veins as he does his best to control his heart rate and try to remain calm. Charles says that he put his hands up as this would-be robber tells the cashier to put all the money the store had into a plastic bag. The cashier tells him to give him a second as he reaches below the front counter. What Charles, myself, or the robber didn't know was that this gas station clerk was packing heat. And not just any sort of heat. A pump action shotgun. The man with the pistol immediately runs out of the store but not before tripping and falling, thanks in part to the Slim Jim display that was nearby. The pistol went flying and Charles, bless his heart and bravery, grabs said pistol. The man booked it out of the store and runs across the parking lot, disappearing into the nearby wilderness. I witnessed this last part myself, where Charles had picked up the pistol. So now that we're reunited in the story, I explain to you what occurred next. I called 911 from my cell phone as the cashier told us to remain by his side. Thank God officers were dispatched in a matter of minutes and soon alleviate our stress and fears by taking in our information. Meanwhile, a few other officers go and check the nearby woods. The man, thank goodness, didn't get too far and was caught less than 10 minutes later. The officers praised both the cashier and Charles on their quick thinking I don't think Charles was expecting to thwart the would-be robber, but what a story he had to tell his mom and dad when he made it back to my house later on. The rest of the time Charles spent with my family and I was very peaceful, and even all these years later, we will sometimes bring up the incident and have ourselves a good laugh. For some context, I'm a single 32-year-old female that lives in a town in Oklahoma. This happened roughly three years ago, a couple of days before 4th of July. I just got him back from the supermarket where I bought a whole bunch of food for the party I was going to have. My brother, aged 29 years old, was going to come over to help me decorate. But in the meantime, I had just stepped into the shower, advising him over text message that I left the back door unlocked. About halfway through my shower, I hear a sudden loud crash come from the kitchen, the kind of sound made when pots and pans fall to the floor. Because my brother is notoriously clumsy, I thought he had bumped into the table, which caused everything to fall to the ground. 
I figured I would just deal with them once I was changed. Anyway, fast forward roughly 7 or 8 minutes, I just stepped out of the shower and put on my robe. For whatever reason, I decided to take a peek out the restroom window, which overlooks the front lawn and driveway. I then see my brother pull up in his truck, which immediately started to ring some serious alarm bells. If my brother had just gotten here, then would it cause a noise just a few minutes ago? As I stood there wondering, I hear the sound of my bedroom door open. The bathroom I'm in is connected to my room by the way, which was why I ended up hearing the sounds. Anyway, time seemed to have slipped into slow motion. If I tried yelling for my brother, whoever had gotten in here would know the house was occupied. Not that I'm sure how it wasn't obvious by the sound of running water. That's why I opted instead to hide behind the door frame. If I was lucky, whoever was in my home would try entering the restroom. Then if he walked in far enough, I could run past him, then down the stairs toward my brother. I couldn't have planned it any better. Literally, like I just finished describing, a man who was holding a knife walks into my restroom and takes a look into the bathtub, which I'd covered using the shower curtains. I book it without even looking back, not caring if my robe fell off or not, which it never did. I didn't know you were that happy to see me, my brother jokingly said. I don't even respond because I was just that scared. I grab his hand and pull him out toward the backyard. What's up with you? Why are you so scared? You look like you just saw a ghost. Then suddenly he goes silent when we can see the man staring at the two of us from inside the kitchen. We book it toward his truck, where my brother grabs the shotgun he keeps in the back seat as protection. Seeing this, the man books it into another neighbor's backyard. I call the cops, and luckily they find him less than 20 minutes later, hiding in that same neighbor's shed. By the way, he had made off with a bunch of my jewelry and some money I had lying around on the dresser, which thankfully when all was said and done, was returned to me. Here's some background information for all of you. I live in a small town in southern Pennsylvania that's located right next to a dog park. This means it's fairly common to hear commotion throughout the day. It's not really a bother for me, however, since I work 9am to 5pm, and by the time I drive home, it's close to 6pm. By this point, the park is starting to settle, and any sort of noise is kept to a minimum. So you would expect silence at 3 in the morning, right? Not exactly. It was roughly a month ago, and I was having difficulty falling asleep. I blame it on the cups of coffee I chugged like a bottle of milk, since I was staying up trying to work on some art commissions that I do for my job. Anyway, I'm rocking back and forth in my bed with my eyes closed, when all of a sudden I hear footsteps in my living room. My eyes widened and I'm immediately perked up like a meerkat listening for signs of a predator. The footsteps then begin to grow louder as they start to make their way down the hallway toward my room. I went ahead and grabbed my pistol I kept next to my nightstand and sit there in bed while pointing toward my door the entire time. An estimated 30 seconds come and go, and I can no longer hear the footsteps. This was the point I grew impatient, and I make the decision to locate the source of the noise myself. This is a big mistake. I should have just stayed in my room and locked myself in there. As soon as I peek into the hallway, I just so happen to see a shadow cast against the living room. I went ahead and tiptoe my way to the living room, slippers masking my footsteps, like that one perk from Call of Duty. I think it's called Dead Silence if I remember. And that's when I see them. There's a man going through one of my own dressers. What are you even doing in my house? Who are you? He suddenly stops and looks in my direction. You have about five seconds to get out of my house, or my presence alone is going to be the last thing on your mind. I'm sorry, I thought this was my house. He replies to me grasping a large knife and backpack. Did he really think I was that dumb? No, I think it's just because that was the first thing he could possibly think of in that moment. Anyway, he drops the backpack and then books it out of my house, 
I then proceeded to call the cops, keeping an eye on my law and making sure he didn't come back. Two police officers arrived and I gave them a statement as well as a description of the man. Unfortunately, it's been over five months now and the wannabe burglar has yet to be brought to justice. When this first happened, back in the early 2000s, I sorta of just laughed it off thinking it might have been some sort of dumb prank, but years later as I reflect on it, I understand that I was in a very dangerous situation. As I have spent the last few years listening to scary stories here on YouTube, I have been made aware of how common this sort of activity is, but that's what makes it that much more chilling. To begin, I used to be a truck driver that delivered chips to various outlets, places like grocery stores, convenience stores, 7-Eleven, you get the idea. As with any truck driving job, I was often tasked with making deliveries across the country. This was the one bonus I enjoyed about driving trucks. Ever since I was a kid, I dreamed of a job where I could see the whole country and I was living my dream. It's just a shame that dream had to be tarnished. I was just off the clock one evening and I was making the one hour drive back from the Pittsburgh area. If anyone is from that part of the country, you know that once you're at a city limits, you're practically out in the middle of nowhere. You might see the occasional home in the distant fields, but other than that all you had to keep you company was the road. Anyway, at around 10.30pm my headlights shine upon somebody laying in the middle of the road. I quickly come to a stop and see that it's a woman. Immediately my first concern was something had happened to her which was why I get on the phone and dial 911. But while I'm talking to a dispatcher, she suddenly got up and heads to my driver's side. Never mind, she appears to be okay. Let me ask her what's going on. I tell the operator, who just like me was confused with the details that I was providing. Hey, mister, do you think you could give me a ride back to my house? I'm not really feeling too good. She replies back with a very serious look across her face. I didn't want to assume, but the way she spoke just really didn't feel genuine. Oh well, I already called 911. They're sending EMTs and police officers as we speak. Her facial expression suddenly changed, and she jumps off of the truck and runs to the other side of the street toward the passenger side window. This was for a very brief moment I saw someone in a hoodie holding a gun. Both the woman and this armed individual then run into the nearby woods. I wasn't sure what to think of it, which was why I booked it back home until I later spoke with the police and clarified what had taken place. Unfortunately, nothing ever came up and they never did find the duo. So to this day, it has remained a mystery. One thing is for sure, however, she was purposely trying to get someone to pull over. That's where her partner, who was waiting in the nearby trees, would then jump out armed and try to take the vehicle over. For privacy reasons, I won't give an exact location, but I will say I live in a small town in North Dakota. This is the sort of town where everyone knows each other and people leave their doors and windows unlocked. This is why I wasn't expecting to have quite a scare a few years ago. Anyway, I was taking care of the house since my parents were out for the weekend on a business trip Alongside me was my five-year-old Siberian husky Joey, who was pretty much like a brother since I was an only child. Oh yeah, before I forget to mention, I was 17 years old, and I'm male. It was night number two of the three days of me being by myself, and I decided to order some pizza. Parmesan pizza with grilled chicken and spinach to be exact. As Joey and I waited for the meal, which my app told me would take about 40 minutes, I opted to take Joey for a quick walk in the forest that's just behind my home. If you follow this dirt trail long enough, it shoots you out into the town shopping center and even a small park. I would be walking for maybe just 15 minutes so I had plenty of time to pay for the food once I got there. All seems to be going according to plan, until a light sprinkle forced Joey and I to quicken our pace. About two minutes before reaching my home, I got a text message from the pizza store saying that the driver would be there in less than five minutes. Perfect timing. However, Joey decided he needed to use the restroom. Go figure. 
And like any dog owner, you know dogs always have to find that perfect spot to do their thing. Joey was very picky and notorious for his shenanigans, thus he caused us to be late. But little did I know that this would end up saving me, and Joey. By the time I reach the clearing of the forest, I see my home in the distance, and the pizza delivery man is standing by his car. But that wasn't all I could see. In the driveway was an unmarked SUV that I didn't even recognize. That was really strange. It's not like my parents would downgrade their vehicle and show up unexpected like that. Whatever the case was, I meet up with a pizza delivery man and he mentions something that shook me to the core. Glad I could make the delivery. Uh, maybe this isn't my business, but I could have sworn I saw a couple of people in ski masks pass by the curtain inside your home. I reassured him that I was walking my dog Joey and I asked him if he was serious. He assures me that he was, and just then Joey started to growl and I could see all the hair on his back start to stand up. What is it boy? I say to him in a calming demeanor. He then starts to bark and all of a sudden we hear the sound of a loud crash come from inside the house. I joined the pizza delivery man by going into his truck and we called the police department from a safe distance. Luckily the police are less than 5 minutes from my home and they arrive just as two masked men walk out the front door. And the scariest part of it all, we can see that they had knives. Both of them book it toward my backyard, but luckily the police are able to capture them before they get too far. Once all was said and done, I ended up finding out that they had broken in, thanks in part to the key that I had hiding underneath the doormat. Again, safe town was supposed to mean trust. After this happened, however, my neighbors and I grew more weary of our surroundings, but luckily, nothing like this has ever happened again, and I hope it just remains that way. Looking back on this incident, I do find it more bizarre than anything. I thought I'd share it with all of you to see what you all think. At the time, this being in the early 2000s, I was in the process of moving out of my parents' home, Seeing as I was 30 years old, it was about time. Things should have been fairly smooth. Move in, get accustomed to the neighbors and the scenery, and just work and live my life in peace. Too bad it wasn't that way at the start. Let me just very quickly describe the locale of where my home was. I was living in a small town in middle America where the largest accumulation of people would be the local Walmart. I swear any time I was shopping on a Friday night, you'd see half the townsfolk. Speaking of the townsfolk, my nearest neighbor was at least a half a mile away. I only wanted to bring this context up so you get a basic understanding of what I'm dealing with here. Life being quiet, mundane, and apart from doing shopping, you don't really talk to people, unless family come by. So back to moving in. Since I was in the process of moving, Having furniture and movers in and out of the house, the doors were left open for most of the day. I didn't take issue since I was there as it was happening, and again, the lack of people, I didn't really worry. I want to say it was the third or fourth day of the move and I was in the backyard tending to the rose garden, which I'd planted in honor of my late wife. I can still remember it being a warm 80 degrees, as my sun-kissed skin could feel the tingling of the rays that were shining upon me and the sweat dripped down my brow as I realized I could use a water break right now. I looked over to my water bottle and sure enough I noticed it was empty. So I get up, dirt falling from my knees which stuck to me from the sweat and I start to make my way to the back door in the kitchen. As soon as I'm in there I get all the immediate satisfaction of the air conditioning which was such a relief after being outside for almost an hour. This relief would soon be temporary because I ended up hearing something at this moment. What exactly am I referring to, you might be asking yourself? Footsteps coming from the second story. I had to do a double take in this moment because I thought perhaps the movers were still working, but they weren't supposed to get there until later in the evening. So what's the cause of this noise? I grabbed a kitchen knife out of paranoia, seeing as I was and still am the paranoid type and I step into my living room. That's where the staircase is. As I start to inch my way up each step, 
wood squeaking and echoing throughout the empty house. I heard the sound of the footsteps go silent. My heart was racing at a million miles an hour, half expecting that my place might have been haunted and I was going to stumble into a ghost. It's at this moment I became so paranoid. I told myself that a knife wasn't going to be enough. I would now need to grab my shotgun from the gun safe just in case I was dealing with some sort of home intruder. That safe being located in my bedroom by the way. I quickly grabbed it, nerves at an all time high, and as I'm returning back to the second story hallway, I heard something tip over in the guest bedroom. I quickly raced over, like a soldier in Call of Duty, and as I kicked the door in, I bump into a person in a hoodie and a balaclava going through my closet. Oh, I thought nobody was home, the man said as he stuttered and started to shake. If you don't leave right now and stop what you're doing, you're going to get shot. I scared the man out of his wits. I escorted him out of my house, shotgun never leaving my grasp, and he runs off into the nearby woods. I then heard a car engine and watched as a minivan suddenly took off. I was left in absolute shock. The absolute audacity of this home burglar to not only assume the house was empty, but to even break in to begin with. Yes, maybe it was partially my fault I left the door unlocked since I was expecting the movers to come in, but I shouldn't have to worry about this sort of thing. The movers did arrive a couple of hours later, and naturally I did inquire about the home burglar from earlier. They had no clue of what I spoke of, not that I was really surprised. I didn't get into contact with a friend of mine who worked at the police station, but unfortunately they never did catch the guy. However, I think I might have scared him so much that he decided to retire from his days of burglary, as in the years I continued to live there, I never had anything like that happen again. And by the way, I pretty much converted that home into the equivalent of Fort Knox, as I ended up getting two amazing German shepherds and an alarm system that was installed into my home. I guess that's some advice I could give to all of you. It doesn't matter where you live, you better make sure you're prepared. Whether it be cameras, security systems, dogs, etc. Make sure those burglars and home intruders don't have any opportunities to break in. Edit, I forgot to mention, but I now live in Juneau, Alaska. So, creepy fox. If you're ever in that area, feel free to hit me up. I can tell you all about the amazing food places we have, as well as even offer some insight to the amazing places where you can go and film. To this day, I wonder what would have happened had I stayed around. Oh, hey there, I don't mean to get too ahead of myself. This happened when I was in high school, 2004. I believe if I remember correctly, it was sophomore year. I was living in a small town in Oklahoma, an average ordinary place where everyone knew each other. For privacy reasons I'm not going to name the exact place since I still live here at this time. Anyway, this town is the kind where my family, as well as those who live around us, leave their doors and windows unlocked. It's a bad habit that still happens today, but in a way we are more cautious. Back then my friends and I would stay up late on the weekends. We would play football and even soccer, seeing as we had acres and acres of farmland to play on. One night in particular, myself and a huge group of friends decided that we wanted to play hide and go seek in our neighborhood. There were about 10 of us in total, including me. My friend Amber was to be the finder, which meant myself and all of us others were going to spread into the nearby field hiding behind some trees, bushes, and barns. Of course, there were some rules. It's not like we were going to run over to the next town. This meant we kept it within a certain radius. I ended up hiding behind some large stalks of corn while I watched some of my friends head to the typical spots. One by one, Amber began to find us with the help of her flashlight, and before I knew it, I was the only one remaining. Yes, I still like to think of myself as the hide-and-go-seek champion. There were still 10 minutes left on the timer we had set, which meant I had some fun avoiding my friends. However, in this time, I noticed while I hid in the field, there appeared to be an abandoned white van. 
Best way I can describe it is the typical creeper van. Now looking back, I knew going anywhere near it was an absolutely terrible idea. But curious of a teenager like me, I was like, Hey, you see that van over there? Let's go check it out. Ugh, what it's like to be dumb and naive. I began to walk over to the van with my flashlight when I started to suddenly hear talking. I also was able to see some smoke rise from the other side. I knew it wasn't my friends since they were all clearly looking for me in the opposite direction. Well, when I walked over to the other side and shined my flashlight, I stumbled into a couple of guys that appear to be in their mid to late 20s. They look like your typical drug junkies with beat up messy clothing and hair. I was also able to see that they were burning some sort of substance in glass tubes. Well, I figured it was better not to bother them, but I kid you not. One of them pulls out a gun and start shouting at me. This actually caught the attention of all my friends, who came running toward me after seeing my flashlight shine everywhere in distress. I really think these two were completely out of their minds. They must have mistaken me for a cop or something else. That or my sudden appearance had suddenly spooked them. Anyway, the one who appeared to be a little more there, mentally speaking, calmed the one with the pistol down and he just told me to scram. Well, that's the PG way of putting it. I run over to my friends and we then head to my house where we call the cops. Sadly, by the time the police got there, those two guys had driven away. To this day, I don't think they were from our town to begin with. I also believe since this was around 9pm, under the complete darkness of the night, they didn't think that they would be caught. But still, why there of all places? I don't really know. But all these years later, that goes down as one of the creepiest happenings of my life. For some context, I'm male and I'm around 6 foot 2 inches, 230 pounds. Nothing really scared me in life until this happened just a few weeks ago. It was a Friday night roughly around 8 in the evening and I was with 5 friends. Two were my best friends, the others were 3 girls. I remember my mother said I could use her Toyota Tacoma that night to go to a party. I lived in Arizona my whole life so I know the roads very well. As for the party which would be located in the middle of the desert, it was just outside of Casa Grande in a small town called Maricopa. We had a good time and all my friends had clearly had more drinks than they could handle. I myself partied a bit, if you know what I mean, but this wasn't my first rodeo so to speak and I was used to these sorts of conditions. So on our way back home, myself and my friends had to go down this 50 mile stretch of road with the occasional house scattered here and there. I was going maybe 90 miles an hour and the girl I was with in the front pointed to something in the middle of the road. I slowed to a stop and a woman emerged from a car before walking over to my Toyota Tacoma. For your information, before this I put a couple of light bars on the truck so I could see in dark places. The normal headlights weren't exactly the best, which was why I could tell the lights were too much for this woman to handle. Mistakenly I turned them off, dumb decision as I looked back. Anyway, she walks over to the window and asked me if I could help her put a spark plug in because she told me she didn't know how to do it. Alarm bells began to ring in my head, but me being the kind person I am, I said, sure, I can do that for you. I tell my friends and girlfriend to give me a minute and I hop out of the vehicle. Now, here's the thing. When I tried to jump start her vehicle, I noticed that it had been intentionally immobilized. I was really confused, but that confusion would soon be interrupted when I hear my girlfriend in my truck yelling. I look to see a man trying to reach into the window where my girlfriend was currently seated. So I run over to the driver's seat and pull out a pistol my mother keeps in there at all times, for self-defense purposes. The man was around 5 foot 2, a lot shorter than me and definitely wasn't going to give me a scare. But then when I turn the headlights on, we are all shocked to see 9 or 10 people standing there in the road. My heart sank and I told everybody in the truck to hang on. 
I immediately busted a 90 degree turn into the desert and before we made it too far, we hear a gunshot. We never look back and I have no idea what their intentions were, but I am pretty sure they weren't up to any good. So my advice for all of you listening, avoid empty roads in the middle of nowhere. You know what I love about living in a small town? It's not having to worry about traffic and people. Everyone in my small town in northern Texas is always friendly. You can walk down the street and have people smile, wave, and actually say hello. People also look out for one another. My job as a security guard at one of our shopping centers has me doing the same. With around 3,500 people, I've pretty much grown to know everyone and everyone knows me. I'm the security guard who loves donuts and telling stories about my time in the marines. Now you think I wouldn't have a scary story to tell regarding my time as a security guard, but I do have one that might pique your interest. It was a few years ago and I had been inside my office, checking out the CCTV cameras while eating some leftover pasta my wife had made. It was around 2 in the morning. I remember being interrupted by what looks like movement on one of the monitors. It was the camera that faces the area in which an ATM machine sits. That ATM machine was at the front of a grocery store that I'm also in charge of monitoring. I kept an eye on the camera, soon seeing two hooded figures walking around the area. I wanted to see more, so I switched my attention to some other camera angles. I could see they were the only two in the parking lot. Next to them was a van. I did find it suspicious, so I chowed down my food, grabbed my service pistol, and by the way, I am part of a security force that is allowed to carry a weapon, and now I walk on over, and sure enough I could see these two individuals fiddling around with the ATM machine. I assumed that they had to be teenagers since I caught a few of them just the other week trying to break into a grocery store. I ended up reaching them, and then I say, hey is there something you need help with? Both of them are suddenly startled and turn around to reveal that they were wearing bandanas, covering half of their face. I need you two to leave. This is no place to be messing around. What they did next was something I'd only experienced once in my military career. They each took out a gun from their jackets, pistols to be exact, and they proceeded to point them directly at me. Be quiet and don't even think about moving. One of them said with an intimidating voice. All of a sudden, I was in a sort of standoff, if you will. One you could imagine seeing from an old western movie. Sure, I could have taken out my service weapon, but I wasn't going to have enough time to take out both. Therefore, I stayed calm and I listened to their instructions. They get into their van and just like that, they make their getaway. I remember breathing a sigh of relief as I get my bearings. And then I head back to the office drenched with sweat. After police came to take my statement and check out the cameras, they said they would go ahead and investigate the entire thing. Sadly, the cameras didn't get the license plate and I didn't manage to remember it myself personally. Also, since they were wearing hoodies and bandanas, it was almost impossible to get any sort of identifiable features. As for the description of their getaway vehicle, it wasn't enough to locate them. We are very certain they were trying to steal money from the ATM machine, but I managed to thwart their plans when I saw them. I am still sure to this day they weren't planning to shoot at me, but that's just hopeful and wishful thinking. I'm not sure. To this day, I still work the same job, and I've never had anything remotely like this happen to me again. I was around 14 years of age and I was finally looking to earn some extra money. This was so I could go to the gas station and grab chips or soda or anything my teenage self desired. I had worked at the preschool my mom teaches at and I did enjoy being around kids. It was exciting. I was essentially earning extra money to play and have fun. This was why I wanted to go ahead and start my own babysitting get up. I went ahead and worked on some posters and started to put them up around town. By the way, this was in 2016, in a small town known as Wrightwood in California. Most people might not think much of that specific year, but if you've been around the internet for long enough, 
You know, this was the year of the clown sightings. Huh, what a fun time that was, am I right? Anyway, before I knew it, I had a babysitting job looking after a little boy, three years of age. The day arrived and I head over to their house, where their parents go over everything. Bedtime, allergies, food schedule, the typical. Soon they had left and promised to be back no later than 8pm. So kiddo, anything you want to do? I said with a friendly smile. I love to draw, let's do that. He replied back, full of energy and innocence. Thankfully, thinking ahead, I take out a bunch of coloring books and crayons from my backpack. We then sat down at a table and we started to draw. I recall sketching some trees myself, thinking about my crush. Some time passes and the kid hands me a picture that he drew. It was a picture of a clown. That's a really cool clown, I said as I congratulated him with a high five. Thanks, he's the one who visits me at night. Huh, I guess this is the clown from his dreams. I pondered silently as I meet his eyes with a smile and an awe. Hey, it's still light outside. You want to go jump on the trampoline? Yeah. He then spent the next while jumping, tumbling, and laughing. Before we knew it, the sun was setting and I told him it was time to head inside. We now read some books until he eventually fell asleep on my lap. I now take him upstairs and put him in his cute red car bed. After I head downstairs to watch some TV and work on some homework I brought along with me, there I was relaxing, eating snacks, and this is when I hear something outside. I listened in for a few seconds, but then I brushed it off as just a squirrel. But then I recognized it. It was the trampoline. Bear in mind, this is a small town, so I assume the only people who could possibly be jumping on it were just kids. Either way, I wanted to go check things out. I head outside thinking that I was going to tell some kids to get off the trampoline, but I realized just how dark it had gotten. I walked over to the trampoline, and the next thing I knew, I went cold. How I wish it was just a couple of neighborhood kids. Instead, I see a clown with one of the creepiest masks I would ever seen in my entire life. It had this unnatural smile on it with a big red afro. I was left in shock and tried to be as quiet as I could all the while walking back into the home. Thankfully I made it in without making a single noise. I then locked the door and then grabbed a kitchen knife, ready for the worst. Not long after that, I heard a loud bang coming from upstairs. My immediate thought was he climbed to the second story and then broke in through a window. So I run upstairs and to my absolute shock, I see the clown in the kid's bedroom. What I hear was something along the lines of the clown trying to convince the boy to go with them. Without the clown hearing me, I quickly grab the phone and then I scream, you need to get out of this house before the police get here. I was fuming with anger but admittedly also shaking with fear. The guy in the clown costume then screamed and jumped outside. I should note that this was from the second story. The dude seriously runs off without showing any signs of being hurt. My heart rate at this point was super high, and within minutes police officers arrived and investigated the entire thing. However, during the investigation, I must have passed out from being so scared because I awoke in the hospital some time later. They told me that I had fainted. Since that day, I'm super frightened by just the sight of a clown. Even random noises in my home just get to me for some reason. I've had other creepy things happen before, but this one definitely comes out. On top is the worst incident of my entire life. Hey everyone, so I wanted to go ahead and discuss something with all of you. Um, don't click off of the video just yet. Um, if you do click off of the video and then you ask something regarding this in the comment section, um, I'll just go ahead and refer you to this part of the video so you can kind of listen in. Um, so I talked to you guys more of a serious manner like this. I think it was two weeks ago. Um, I forget exactly which video it was. But basically, I was going over how this month of August has kind of been the month of the compilation, if you will. Uh, as you saw, most of the episodes were compilations. 
Uh, the only exception is the school stories episode, that one did contain all brand new stories. That was of course thanks to the subscribers who sent in those stories. The San Francisco stories video contained three brand new stories, and then three of the other stories were some previous San Francisco stories we covered, and then this episode contained two brand new stories at the beginning, and then the other stories were some other small town stories we've covered. And basically, like I discussed in that previous episode at the outro, the reason why I've been doing these compilation episodes is basically just trying to show YouTube and their algorithm like, hey, you know, my channel is still alive, I'm still alive, so please, you know, promote my videos. Because basically, for reasons I still can't even explain to this day, um, my videos don't really get pushed out to people as much as before. I get a lot of people that tell me that they don't even know I'm still uploading because YouTube doesn't even send them out notifications or I don't even appear in the, uh, I was going to say timeline, uh, but what am I looking for here? Oh, the feed, I guess the, the, you know, your feed when you're scrolling through the videos, uh, they don't appear for whatever reason, even though they used to. Um, your guess is as good as mine as to why, you mean I'm uploading videos, but I mean, it could possibly be because I'm not uploading as much um, as, say, my other fellow narrators. Maybe that could be one of the reasons why my videos don't get pushed out. So basically, this month of August was me trying to, like I said, show the algorithm that, hey, you know, I still exist. Please, you know, make sure that you're pushing out my videos um, to my subscribers because, you know, there's a lot of you all I know that are out there that really enjoy these uploads. And it's a shame that you don't get to see them because YouTube doesn't notify you. And, you know, thank you to everyone that actively looks to my channel and checks in a couple times a week to see if I've uploaded. But um, you shouldn't have to do that. YouTube should, you know, be notifying you all and telling you like, hey, you know, Creepy Fox uploaded a new video. So again, thank you to all the wonderful folks that are checking in constantly and checking to see if I'm uploading anything. Uh, even though the uh, notifications aren't working. But yeah, that was basically why there are compilations, is I'm just trying to create watch time on the channel so that YouTube will push out the videos. Um, regarding this month of September, however, we're going to go ahead and um, start to go a little bit more down in the sense that I'm not going to be uploading as much in September, basically just because I don't want to bombard you guys with so many compilation episodes. Um, I feel like we already did that for a month, you know what, like we did that for that month. Now I want to go ahead and present um, brand new uploads with brand new stories. But um, as you all know, I do rely heavily on subscriber submissions. I have mentioned this, I've mentioned this in the past. I mentioned this in the video I mentioned, um, but basically I, I don't want to read from Reddit. Um, I, I know there's narrators out there that upload a lot because they source from Reddit. That's perfectly fine. You know, the fellow narrators that do that, you know, totally go for it. Um, I just personally don't do it because the thing is that a lot of narrators that do these true scary stories, just in case, you know, you didn't know, um, yeah, I know a lot of people wonder like, hey, you know, why am I hearing the same stories across all these channels I'm subscribed to? Basically, the reasoning for that is because most uh, True Scary Stories narrators read from a subreddit that's called Let's Not Meet. And so um, that's why you hear a lot of these stories. And, you know, it's not the narrator's fault because, you know, narrators are living their lives and they're trying to build their channels. They don't have time to listen and see if a story has already been narrated. That's basically why I kind of live off the notion of if it's already been posted on Reddit and if that author allows the story to be narrated, the story's already been narrated by someone. And I don't want to do that, you know, where I give you guys a whole bunch of uploads, but then they're just going to be stories you've heard from other channels. Which is why, again, I keep uh, wanting to make sure and let you all know that if you do have a story that you'd like to submit, uh, make sure to send it in so we can continue doing these uh, videos with brand new stories. Um, just because right now I don't really have that many stories right now to upload um, video-wise. So 
That is why for the month of September, you will drastically notice there will be a decrease in uploads. Um, compilation wise, just so you guys know ahead of time, I have four compilations coming out the rest of this year. I have the uh, Thanksgiving stories compilation, um, Christmas, New Year's, uh, what else am I missing? Halloween. And then hopefully if, you know, subscribers can send in stories along with those compilations for those holidays, I'll also have brand new episodes for the holidays. So, you know, I'll have a brand new Halloween stories video, a brand new Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's stories a video to accompany those compilations. But yeah, basically that was pretty much just what I wanted to mention. It was again, give an explanation to why you all got compilation episodes in the month of August, letting you all know that the upload schedule will start to kind of die off a little bit for September. Um, and again, just to kind of um, push it out again that if you did want to send in your story, make sure to do so because then basically the more stories that get sent in to me, I can go ahead and uh, give back to you all in the sense that I can get you even more uploads. So basically it's a supply and demand thing. There's a demand for videos, but there's no supply. So basically I can't really give you that much. But anyway, um, I'm rambling here. I'm going to go ahead and let the normal outro play. Thank you so much for listening to this and for making it this far. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to hit that like button and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. And subscribe and turn on notifications if you're brand new. Also, make sure to check out our song, Make a Start. You can find it on Apple Music, Spotify, or even here on YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel and check it out underneath the Creepy Fox topic section. Also, consider grabbing some Creepy Fox merchandise, which you can see right below the video. And if you want early access to brand new videos with no advertisements, as well as exclusive narration videos not available to anyone else, consider becoming a channel member. Which, speaking of, I'd like to go ahead and give them all a shout out. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Scott, Sean, Corey, Linz, Maribel, and our newest member, Medu Satel. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the uploads, like, comment, and share them with their family and friends. I appreciate and love every single one of you. Thanks once again for stopping by, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.